Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this uh, interesting conference. So I was told that the, the, the main topic of the conference was the solitons in condensed matter. And uh, of the things, activities that's happening in my lab, I thought, well, maybe the, the our effort to create quantized vortices in axon polariton condensate would fit the, the theme of the conference very well. So that's uh, the title that I submitted. And that's also what, what I will be talking about. But, but also, uh, <clears throat> uh, after uh, hearing the, the a number of talks over the, the past two days, uh, I thought uh, maybe uh, some of your some of the audience would be actually interested in topological superfluid helium. So uh, I'm. I'm going to uh, present, if I have, if time permits, I'll present a little bit of a uh, uh, current effort that's going on in our lab uh, in an attempt to basically uh, detect the edge current in superfluid helium. And so uh, that's uh, basically the, the outline of the talk today. So, <clears throat> uh, so this is uh, the, my collaborators including the, the students who has done most of the work on the exton polariton project. So the, the <clears throat> main uh, contributors are uh, my, my former and current students, Dr. Byung Yong Oh, Min Park, and Dr. Choi Dae Gwang and Dr., uh, Mr. Kwon Min Sik are the students from uh, Professor Yong Hun Cho's group. And so it's a main collaboration is between our two groups at KAIST. And then the, the PCS theoret, we've got some theoretical support from the, the PCS and also the samples that I'll be talking about today were provided from KIST. So uh, since there wasn't any talk on exton polaritons during this talk, I'm gonna give a very quick introduction on what exton polaritons are. So uh, in solid state physics, we learned that in semiconductors, you can actually excite an electron hole pair by you know, electrical or uh, optical means. And when you excite uh, an electric electron hole pair, uh, they, after a long time, they recombine. So the, the electron just falls down to the valence band and that's it. But in, uh, in the intermediate time period, what can happen is that an electron and a hole can actually form a bound state, just like a hydrogen would do with a, a proton and an electron. And that uh, intermediate bound state is what we call an exciton. And uh, in, in some of the cases, these excitons can be mobile and have pick up some mass. So if you look at the dispersion relation of these excitons, they behave like a, a massive particle basically, and it has a quadratic dispersion. Now, so that's the, the exton part of the, the, the exton polariton. And to call something a polariton, you need photon. So uh, when we think about a photon dispersion, it's usually a, uh, a linear, it's a, it's a linear dispersion system. So it, the, the dispersion looks like this, but if you try to confine photons, in a, uh, a two-dimensional structure by placing uh, planet, planar mirrors, two planar mirrors and trap the photons in between, then your photon gets trapped. And so your uh, dispersion can be written in terms of the K vector perpendicular to the mirror and K vector parallel to the mirror. Now, if the distance between these uh, uh, mirrors get close to say the, the, the wavelengths of the photon, then the, the, the wavelengths that can fit in here becomes uh, basically quantized and you get a, uh, a strong <clears throat> uh, confinement effect along uh, perpendicular to the, 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 the mirror plane and your dispersion can be approximated in this form. And then you can see that the in-plane photon behave like a, uh, basically picks up a quadratic uh, dispersion relation. So the dispersion, if you just consider the in-plane dispersion 
of the photon, it uh, changes its form. And at very large uh, wavelength, uh, I mean, very short wavelength and large K, it uh, approaches this uh, linear dispersion limit. Now, uh, if you combine these two systems together, then you can have a uh, photon dispersion and an exciton dispersion, which are both quadratic at a small k limit. However, if the, the photon energy and exciton energy are far apart, nothing happens. But if you bring them close together, or if you make them cross, then if you zoom in on this region where the photon dispersion and exciton dispersion cross, you can actually get uh, you can approximate this uh, exciton dispersion as a flat uh, dispersion because the effective mass of excitons are usually much, much larger than the effective mass of photon. And in this, you get this band crossing, but because exciton absorb, exciton is basically uh, formed by absorbing photon energy, and then it can also emit photon, exciton and photon can be uh, coupled very strongly. And in that case, you get this band uh, uh, avoiding avoidance, and you get this coupled state of exciton and photon, in, and that's what we call the the exciton polariton. Now, what can we do with it? Uh, oh, so uh, <clears throat> the the system that we use here is a uh, two dimensional structure which is formed by a semiconductor gallium arsenide quantum well, and then you place what's known what's called the 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 distributed Bragg reflector, which is just a fancy way of calling a set of mirrors. <laughs> and you basically sandwich this two-dimensional gallium arsenide in between these uh, uh, DBRs. And then you get this that exact structure that I just talked about earlier. And if you look at the, the, the dispersion, you get this, uh, what we call exton polariton dispersion curve, which uh, bends flat where the, the photon and exciton band crossing happens. Now, the, what's interesting about this system is that when the, the photon escapes the cavity, it actually carries the information about the exciton polariton that it was initially a part of. So if we shine laser into a cryostat where the, the, that sample that I showed you is encapsulated in, <clears throat> And eventually this laser is used to form the exciton polariton, but when the photon escapes that cavity, that emitted cav uh, emission can be actually uh, uh, imaged through a CCD and you can get a real space image, which gives you the, the spatial density information about the exciton polariton. But also if you place a uh, another, uh, lens to transform from the real space into a free space, which is the, the case space, then you can also get a distribution of the, the case space. And also you can, since it's a uh, uh, optical uh, imaging process, you can actually send your uh, emission through a monochromator. And if you do that, you can also get the, the wavelength information of the light, which is inversely proportional to the energy of the, the photon. So you can actually get the energy relation. So if you do that one axis energy plotted against the case space, you can actually directly map your uh, dispersion relation this way. Also, you can construct a, a set of uh, uh, interferometers. If you are interested in extracting the phase information, of these uh, emitted exciton polariton. So you can basically manipulate uh, uh, your optical measurement setup to extract a various information about basically the, the, the wave function of your polaritons. And that's a uh, really hand tool that I've never had with a superfluid helium system. So I was immediately attracted to this uh, uh, versatility in measurement. And so since you can uh, measure the dispersion and also the case space imaging, what you can do is you can try to change the density of the polariton in your system. And as you increase the density, you can see that at 
uh, lower density, you get this parabolic dispersion, but as the density increases beyond what we call the threshold, then you get this uh, uh, concentration of these exton polaritons in low K uh, or K equal to zero uh, state with a sharply uh, focused momentum and energy. And we call this exton polariton condensate because it resembles the behavior of the, the, the Bose-Einstein condensate. However, there is a, a little bit of distinction between uh, uh, exton polariton condensate and the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate in that the Bose-Einstein condensate uh, usually uses a system with a very stable particles, but here the exton polaritons are intrinsically uh, uh, metastable particles that have a uh, very short lifetime. And in some cases, it's not actually uh, well established that uh, there is enough time for the system to fully thermalize. So this is, people still argue about whether this can be regarded as a uh, true Bose-Einstein condensate. So people uh, avoid these issues by calling them exton polariton condensate in this scenario. So that's uh, uh, the system that I'll be dealing with. And uh, the, the community that I'm talking to today probably knows about quantized vortices pretty well. So I don't have to uh, dwell too much on this, but one thing that I'd like to point out is that if you have a superfluid, which can be expressed with a, a single wave function, then the, the the superfluid velocity is actually proportional to the grade, gradient of the, the phase of this uh, uh, wave function. And because this is a gradient of a scalar function, uh, the curl of this velocity is always zero. So superfluid should be intrinsically irrotational. However, if you want to induce the, the rotation into the system, you can actually do it by basically punching a hole in the superfluid and you deplete the, the superfluid. And that's what we call the, the, the vortex in a superfluid. And because of the, the, the wave function has to have a singular value at a given point that constrains the, the, the phase of the wave function around the, uh, any closed loop surrounding this vortex. And it actually has to uh, be quantized. And if you increase the superfluid flow, the quantization just uh, happens with uh, increasing this uh, quantized uh, integer. However, so initially Onsager predicted that the, the, the vortex has to just be integer multiple of uh, flow velocity uh, or, or unit flow velocity. However, what uh, Feynman later find out is that it's actually better to have a multiple singly quantized vortices energetically it's more favorable to do that than have a single multiply quantized vor vortex. So these, uh, uh, in the end, it's actually experimentally found that in superfluid systems, you actually get these uh, multiple vortices instead of a uh, single large vortex. So, <clears throat> Once the, the exton polariton condensate was uh, uh, discovered in 2006, people actually tried to look for the evidence of this type of uh, superfluid-like behavior. And one of the things they tried and succeeded was actually observing these uh, quantized vortex. And like I said earlier, you can actually directly image the, the phase of the wave function that's being emitted from the, the photon out of the uh, polariton. So if you do this uh, 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 interference image, you can see that each of these uh, stripes are the, the modulation of two pi phase. And you get this uh, uh, forking pattern. And when you get this forking pattern in the, uh, the interference image, what it means is that there is actually additional two pi phase on this side compared to this bottom side, half of the region, which means the phase actually has to wind uh, uh, two pi around this single uh, the core. And if you actually uh, map phase out of this uh, interference image, you can actually see this finger point 
where the phase goes around two pi. And this is the, the what I say, the most direct imaging of a quantized vortex that you can get. Now, so this was already some 10 odd years ago. And, uh, and the thing is this vortex here, the, the, the vortex that I've shown you was not actually uh, uh, controlled in any manner. So the, the superfluid vortices that I've shown you earlier were basically generated by either by rotating the, the can of liquid helium or uh, rotating uh, this, uh, you know, droplets of uh, ultra cold gas in various uh, techniques. But here, these vortex in this vortex in exton polariton was actually uh, uh, spontaneously generated around a uh, an impurity which resides in this uh, semiconductor system. So this wasn't any uh, uh, intentionally uh, created vortex. So people later try to manipulate. Uh, uh, create these vortices in various fashions. And <clears throat> so some of the things that people do was uh, uh, was known as this uh, uh, optical parametric oscillation, triggered optical parametric oscillation excitation. And what they do is if you look at this uh, polariton dispersion curve, there's this inflection point upon which you can actually get a parametric, parametric oscillation or, or a parametric pumping so that you can get, uh, uh, you can pump on this side and the scattered beam can uh, go off in opposite momentum and energy direction. And it can sit on this uh, 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 high energy state and also on the, the zero momentum state. And when you, pump your uh, exton, basically you're basically pumping exton polaritons directly onto this uh, dispersion curve. And these uh, uh, scattering between the exton polaritons leaves ha basically half of your ex polaritons on this ground state. And if you have a pulse probe, which has an angular momentum, a laser that has angular momentum, and then this uh, exton polariton that fall onto the ground state ends up with this uh, angular momentum that was initially carried by this probe laser. So, so by doing that, what they were able to do was uh, uh, here <clears throat> uh, develop the, the quantized vortices here. So here you can see that forking pattern of the interference, which is the evidence of a quantum vortex. And a, another thing that they were able to do was they, when they shine the laser with M equals two, they eventually find two M equals one uh, quantum vortices in this case as well. However, this requires two pump probe laser and the, the pump laser has to be exactly matched on this uh, 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 dispersion curve with finite K and finite energy to induce this parametric pumping onto the, the ground state. And so this is experimentally uh, a little challenging to carry out. And <clears throat> other methods has been also uh, introduced. So in this case, what people did was they actually shine four different lasers with a finite momentum. And that finite momentum are designed such that it makes this uh, complete loop at the center. And so they're basically generating flow with a linear combination of uh, exton polaritons with linear momentum and the four different linear momentums are expected to create a loop flow and that ends up creating this uh, quantum vortex. So this is the theory and this is the experiment. And depending on how much momentum you provide in these uh, linear uh, uh, momentum, you can get either single quantized vortex or a doubly uh, two uh, single vortices. 
And, and also there were other techniques where people try to uh, uh, form interesting beam shape to create that uh, flow around a certain point and creating these vortices. And these are, are the experiments where they shine six different laser spots that creates this kind of a spiraling flow and that at the center of that spiral, these quantized vortices were observed. And <clears throat> these are uh, and, uh, a slightly different way of creating vortices is if you just uh, uh, inject linear flows without particular design, you can get these uh, flow of the, the superfluid interfering with each other and you get this uh, quantized vortex, anti-vortex pair or pairs. And these are also some schemes that were used. But at the end, we thought that it's a little convoluted to do things in this uh, fashion. So we wanted to come up with a method of controlling vortex in a simpler uh, fashion. So we started by uh, uh, creating laser with a uh, orbital angular momentum. So it's uh, in, in optics community, they call this a Laguerre Gaussian beam. And it's a uh, fairly standard technique, I guess. So what we did was we start with this uh, uh, laser with orbital angular momentum and we shine this uh, with a high enough energy such that we get this uh, exton hole, uh, electron hole pair or, uh, or a plethora of electron hole pairs. And they'll initially form exton by you know, scattering through the phonons and it will come down to the exton state. And, any, and they form this exton reservoir and any remaining photon in the cavity will couple with this exton and then it will slowly uh, again, through the, the, the scattering with the, the medium, it will slowly fall down to the ground state. And when this happens, what, what we were thinking was, so if you start with pumping energy into the, the system with an orbital angular momentum, would that actually survive in the end at this ground state? And it's not immediately obvious because this is not a closed system like a superfluid helium or, or quasi-closed system like uh, uh, cold atoms. Because here we rely on uh, constant, not constantly, but initially pumping large number of extons or electron hole pairs, and they will relax down to this polariton ground state by losing energy and also the a lot of particles through the process. So this is uh, an open system. So it wasn't immediately obvious that we would be able to get a uh, 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 vortex with this way, but uh, we tried and it turns out uh, it works. And here's how. So like I said, we've uh, sh shown laser with the different orbital angular momentum and equals uh, zero, one, and two. And this is the, 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 the reflected laser, which you can see with the L equal plus one, and you can see this clearly forking pattern in this uh, interference, which, which shows that the, or the, the, the laser itself has orbital angular momentum. Now, below threshold, meaning that if, you, if the laser intensity is weak enough, the number of polaritons is not enough to form uh, what we call exton polariton condensate. And so this is what we call basically the normal fluid of exton polariton. And here you don't see any uh, hole in the center. However, interestingly, if you shine laser with enough intensity, and if you form the condensate, you get this, you see this uh, hole forming in the polariton emission and there is also the, the, the forking pattern in the interference image, which shows the existence of the, the polar, uh, vortex, quantized vortex in polariton. So what this tells us is that the laser itself 
the angular momentum of the laser is not necessarily conserved in the system because if here, if that's the case, the, the, the normal fluid should flow with some uh, uh, vorticity, but you don't see that. You can only see it only uh, if, the, the, if you form the extemporiton condensate. So, and <clears throat> to make sure that uh, 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 we're getting the condensate, we actually also uh, looked at the, the dispersion curve. And below the threshold, you see this parabolic dispersion. And above the threshold, you get this uh, uh, bunching in the, the P equals zero, near the P equals zero state, but it actually doesn't form a single P equals zero state, but you get these at uh, different energy levels. And it turns out that these are actually uh, the key in forming the, the pariton. Uh, of quantized vortices in pariton condensate, which I'll come back to later. And to make sure that uh, this vortex was not just formed by accident, just like the, the for first vortex experiment that I shown you, which was reported in 2008 by some weird flow happening around the, the, the impurity, we actually flip the angular momentum of the, the pump laser. So this is the, M or, M or L equals plus one, L equals minus one. And the pariton actually condensate actually reflects that uh, the orbital angular momentum of the laser. So this is not just uh, a randomly created vortex, but engineered vortex using the, the orbital angular momentum of the laser. Now, oops. Oh. So another thing that we did was we increased the orbital angular momentum to two, L equals two. And here you see that you, the, the forking pattern on, in the interference uh, in two different spots. And if you map the phase, you see that there is a phase winding around these two spots. And which means you've basically created two singly quantized vortices this way. Now, but again, this was a, a, a bit of a surprise because we weren't sure that these uh, angular momentum were, whether it was supposed to be uh, conserved or not. And it turns out that it's not strictly conserved. And that's what, we're, that, that's what I'm going to uh, get to now. So earlier I said, when we look at the dispersion, there were two different energy levels in that uh, condensate, when once the condensate is formed. And this is, this looks similar to that dispersion curve, but here this is the energy in the real space as a function of real space in a single slice. And you see that those two energy levels. And one thing you notice is that the, the low energy state is actually uh, uh, concentrated in the center and the high energy state actually forms this ring. So this is a, a slice of the energy space. So this should be uh, basically uh, uh, azimuthal, this should have azimuthal symmetry or z-axis uh, symmetry. So this is a slice. So if you see these two lobes, that means you basically have a donut shaped uh, emission in this excited state. And so then what we did was we basically did a tomography of this uh, energy space uh, emission. And we basically looked at the, the interference pattern of these two energy levels separately. And one thing you notice is that the, the vortex is actually, so if, so this is the, the, <clears throat> the image of the laser and the bottom two is the emission, one from the, this uh, high energy state and one from the ground state. And if you see the, the excited state, you see this donut shaped thing has a hole punched in it. And right at that uh, hole you get, if you do the interference imaging, you get, and then extract the phase, you get this uh, uh, two pi phase winding. So the, the, the pariton actually has this uh, uh, 
vortex in this uh, high energy state compared to that p equal to zero state. But then it's not a surprise because you know the 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 vortex carrying state should be higher energy than the 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 you know the true ground state with no flow at all. And the the ground state, as you'd expect, doesn't have any uh, phase winding. So the ground state is. Uh, uh, vortex free and this excited state has a vortex. Now, initially we thought, oh, this is rather strange. So does that mean we have two different uh, or, or vortex carrying state and vortex free state simultaneously? And we thought that was the somewhat odd. And then we decided to do the time resolve measurement on this. So <clears throat> here's, uh, the, the, oh, before the, I show you the time resolved measurement, one thing I want to show you is that when we change the, the diameter of that, uh, laser beam that has orbital angular momentum, you see that when the diameter is small, you get only the ground state. Now the ground state energy here is higher than in this case. And that's because these exton polaritons are repulsive, have repulsive interaction. So you get the, 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 the blue shift when you tightly confine exton polaritons in a small space. So we say smaller diameter, you get a slightly higher ground state energy than for larger diameter. But so when you, have a uh, tightly confined geometry, even if you use the orbital angular momentum beam, you get this uh, ground state only. And as you increase the diameter of the, the laser, you, see, you start to see this uh, excited state develop. And when the diameter is large enough, you get predominantly the excited state and the ground state becomes very, very faint. And it turns out what's happening here is that so, these are for different diameter pump beams. And when, you, when we do the time resolved measurement, what happens, it turns out that for a small diameter beam, the, the excited state is there or almost non-existence and the system just stays in the ground state throughout. And when you're in a intermediate uh, uh, diameter, your system starts in the excited state, but as the time goes on, the, the system actually falls to ground state. And at a much later time, the system ends up only in the ground state. And the reason we are seeing these two lobes at the same time is because this was a time integrated image. And basically what it means is the system in an, in an image like this system stays in the excited state about half of the time and in the ground state half of the time. And with a large enough diameter beam, the system actually remains in this most more or less in the excited state. And here, so based on this uh, beam diameter, this shows uh, the, the energy of the, the ground state and excited states. And you basically get this uh, uh, transition from the vortex state to vortex free states only in the, the limited range of the diameter. And if you go to a larger range, you can actually sustain these vortex states more or less indefinitely, but it's not truly indefinite. <clears throat> and uh, so what happens, it turns out is that uh, we've got a help from the, the IBS group here and they've shown that using this driven dissipative gross Pitevsky equation, and the, the, the interesting part here is that there is actually a, a, a external reservoir term here, which uh, uh, couples to the, the polariton. And this external reservoir term is what makes this uh, the, the survival of the orbital angular momentum in the excited state. So the, 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 this, uh, this is what we call the coherent reservoir. So this is the, the amount of exciton that actually preserves the or orbital angular momentum of the laser. And it turns out that you don't need much. So here, if you look at the scale, this is the, 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 the blue one here is the final polariton density. And if you compare the polariton density 
And to coherent reservoir density, it's uh, four or five orders of magnitude smaller. So a very minute amount of the exton reservoir that carries orbital angular momentum, once the exton polariton condenses into this condensate, that coherent nature of the, the polariton condensate actually is driven by the reservoir's orbital angular momentum. And then it basically falls into the same angular momentum state. However, depending on the size of the ring, there is a, a, a competition between the, the ground state and the, the, this excited state. And you basically see this uh, transition from the excited state to the ground state. And that's basically what we've observed. And so in conclusion, what we've managed to do we, was we were able to partially preserve the orbital angular momentum of the laser into this polariton condensate and control the, the, the quantized vortex in this system. And uh, this was, in a sense, a uh, uh, simplest way of creating quantized vortex in a uh, exton polariton. And we are planning to do a various types of uh, uh, fluid dynamics using these uh, exton polaritons in the future. And in the last, three to five minutes, I'm going to quickly talk about the superfluid helium-3. So uh, there are, uh, these are my collaborators. And the work that I will be talking about today is actually mainly a collaboration through the, the University of Queensland group. And <clears throat> uh, we've heard about the, the superfluid phases uh, uh, from Jim on Wednesday. So I'm going to skip this part just mentioned that the, what we call the superfluid helium A phase is what's known as a P plus IP superfluid with an orbital angular momentum or intrinsic orbital angular momentum. And uh, also yesterday, Ashley Cook talked about the, the topology of a momentum space uh, mapped onto the, 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 the real space. And so in this case, the helium three A phase Effective Hamiltonian can be written in this way. And if you in the, the if the chemical potential is positive, this M vector here is basically forms a skirmion in the momentum space. And that is expected to form a chiral edge current in the, the superfluid phase. And that chiral edge current is expected to have this form in the slow varying density limit. And this results in a fairly interesting effect. So if you think about a, uh, a third sound, which is a, uh, which, or, or if, if you think about a sound wave, two orthogonal sound wave in a disc, this is a two orthogonal sound wave. So if we, this is a high density region, the density should flow from high density region to low density region. And these two modes are orthogonal and they usually don't couple to each other. Now, if you have a chiral superfluid, however, there is the system is expected to carry this edge current. And that edge current is also expected to take this form. And if you simplify this equation, you get basically Z cross gradient of N. And the gradient of, L of N is in this direction and the Z vector is perpendicular to this. So you actually get a superflow on a chiral superfluid, if you induce a density gradient and there is a superfluid flow, superflow perpendicular to the density gradient direction. And if you have that, what it means is that this flow, red arrow flow basically couples to this flow, meaning that two orthogonal modes that were initially uncoupled can be coupled through this current. And what this current, is generated in a superfluid film is if you have a chiral superfluid and I'm looking at a cross section here. So there's an edge current that goes in in this boundary and the edge current that flows out on this boundary. And if you deform your surface like this, then you get additional. And if you look at this surface, if you zoom in on this surface, you can think of this as a, a, a number of these small steps and these steps would basically have 
the same chiral current as this edge. So in the end, if you what it means is that if you have this deformed surface, if depending on the, the gradient of the height, the, there is a surface current that flows out of the plane or that flows into the plane. And if you think about this equation, this is rather interesting because there is a current that is perpendicular to the gradient of the density, or in this case, gradient of the height of the film. And this is exactly what a quantum Hall effect is about, right? So what it means is that, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry about all this uh, animation. So if you have a, uh, a voltage gradient, you get a current that is perpendicular to that voltage gradient. And that's what quantum Hall effect is. And here, if you can make this, if you can excite a third sound in, on a superfluid helium A, then what you can do is you can basically create a quantized Hall effect. And uh, with the help of the, the, the University of Queensland group, we've actually calculated the effect of this uh, <clears throat> uh, thermal Hall effect, uh, quantized Hall effect. And so there, so earlier I said, basically this flow, the green flow can couple to this black flow that is orthogonal to orthogonal third, uh, sound mode. However, another way of looking at it is that if there is a chiral flow, that chiral flow should be always perpendicular to the, the, the density gradient. So this green arrow is the simulated chiral flow for a third sound mode with the density gradient developed in this uh, pattern. But you can also look at the third sound mode as instead of two orthogonal modes, we, as a combination of a counterclockwise mode and clockwise and counterclockwise mode. And if you have a clockwise mode, if there is a density gradient developed in this way, the flow should have flow, there should be a flow pattern in this along the black arrow such that this flow, the, the high density region is accumulated on this region. And so it flows count along the clockwise direction. And then there's a counterclockwise flow, which is in the opposite direction. So the third sound with this uh, density gradient just rotates. But when this happens, you can see that this chiral flow is in the same direction, more or less in the same direction as the clockwise mode, as opposed to the counterclockwise mode. So the clockwise mode actually picks up more kinetic energy due to this chiral flow when you develop density gradient along this red to uh, blue direction. And because of that, you basically get a uh, uh, energy splitting between the clockwise and counterclockwise mode. And you can calculate that energy splitting or the frequency splitting of the two uh, uh, third sound modes. And for different uh, uh, best cell modes, you can calculate those. And it turns out for uh, about 17 kilohertz mode, you need to, you should be able to develop about 100 hertz frequency split of the two modes. And for about 120 kilohertz mode, you get about three kilohertz split, which is correspond to a few percent of the sound mode. So if the, if you can, get your third sound mode to have a, a quality factor of about 100, that means you should be able to actually see the splitting of the two counter rotating third sound modes using uh, de developed from the, the quantum hole effect in the superfluid helium. So uh, this is uh, the experimental detection scheme, but uh, since I'm out of time, I'm gonna skip this part and I'll just conclude or leave my conclusion up here and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Choi for interesting talk. So now we are open for questions and comments. Actually, I have uh, one question about that, uh, 
the vertex generation using mm -hmm. the, the larger Gaussian beam okay. in your accident polarity and condensate. Uh, you talk about the orbital angular momentum of the laser beam, mm -hmm. but if we take a local description, then uh, I, I would think that the phase gradient inside of the Laguerre Gaussian beam would to generate a kind of a specially dependent flow in mm -hmm. your pumping. In right. that sense, I mean that uh, using Laguerre Gaussian beam, it can be understood as a compact manner of a multiple laser beam options. So because uh, you just the uh, specially dependent rotating right, kind of, right. uh, flow in your mm -hmm. pumping, and right. then in some case, I mean, that somehow the magnitude is favorable to make a singly quantized vertex there. So in that description, I think uh, the quanta of uh, <clears throat> ang a single angular orbital angular moment would not be that important. No, so, you're, 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 you're absolutely right. So, uh, <clears throat> so it happens. So initially, when we did this experiment, when we put m equals one laser, the, we end up we ended up with say one vortex and then m equals two ended up with two vertices so initially maybe that matters but it, in the end it doesn't <laughs> because oh, okay. uh, it, at the end of the day what it does is just you know uh, stirring the the uh -huh. liquid in a circular fashion that and all that that's all that matters and whether you get one vortex or two vertices will eventually depend on basically how much energy you pump in with this uh, circulation. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, the Professor Cover Kiddis. Um, hi, I thought it was a very interesting talk. I was wondering if you can generate vortices and anti-vortices as well, in addition to same charge vortices, and also if you can do time-resolved uh, measurement of the positions in order to study the interactions between the vortices. So that's what we want to do in the future, but uh, we haven't quite managed to do that, do that yet. Yeah. But Thank that's you. the direction we're taking this experiment. <laughs> okay, great. okay, the Professor Saguan Kim. Mm -hmm. yep, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I have a, some similar questions. So yeah, we have a very uh, similar, so, so you, you talked about this issue of calling this exciton polariton condensate BC, but mm -hmm. we have very similar issue in magnonics. So you right. have <laughs> uh, so-called magnon BC. Right. Many people are debating about that. So, uh, but the, the first thing that th these researchers uh, have done to show that these magnon BCs are real BCs, so they showed this uh, Josephson current. They show the presence of Josephson current between two between two condensates. Right. So can you uh, can you do the similar things by making two condensates and to uh, up, and observe this uh, maybe some current super current between these two condensates? Uh, there 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 isn't a, a successful demonstration of it yet, but it's probably mm -hmm. something the community sh community should uh, try, but. Uh, there, there are some uh, some claims about those Josephson current, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I I haven't seen anything that's convinced me that <laughs> that's the case. So. I, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, thank you. All right, so we don't have uh, time enough. So, okay, so let's thank the uh, Professor Choi. Uh, for Thank his uh, uh, presentations.